Hello everyone, I'm Karine Antunes, uh, Communications Officer at IDRI, and I am really pleased to welcome you today to our conference, which celebrates IDRI's 20th anniversary, um, organized with the European Chair for Sustainable Development and Climate Transition of Sciences Po. You are now on the third debate of the conference titled Reform or Overhaul between Utopia and Realpolitik, What Step Changes in Global Governance? Moderated by Asa Persson, Research Director and Deputy Director of the Stockholm Re Environment Institute. Thank you very much, Asa. Uh, the debate is organized in two parts uh, with around 30 minutes of discussion between the panelists and then about 30 minutes uh, of questions and answers with the audience. If you want to ask uh, questions, you can use the questions and answers section on the right of your screen. Um, this debate is then followed by the fourth session of the conference uh, titled How to Translate International Commitments into Reality. It will start at 3.30 p.m. today and you will be able to join it by clicking in the button called More Sessions at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I think in French uh, it is Toutes les Sessions. So thank you very much. I give now the floor to, to Ms. Persson. Uh, thank you again for accepting uh, our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. And first of all, of course, a very happy birthday to Idri on your 20th anniversary. Congratulations on all the achievements you have made in the past and will undoubtedly have going forward. Um, from the Stockholm Environment Institute, we are very pleased and excited to, as a sister organization uh, in Northern Europe and globally, to work very closely with you uh, in the field of sustainable development and international relations. And I also want to commend you on the choice of topic for this anniversary conference, um, Next Generation Multilateralism, uh, which is so clearly of interest, not just because of the pandemic and all its uh, really significant ripple effects in the global economy and um, for development prospects around the world, not just because of the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis, which are now currently being uh, negotiated and discussed in international meetings, but also as was uh, identified yesterday in the opening of the conference, we are nearing the 50th anniversary of the first UN conference on humans and the environment, which took place in 1972 uh, in Stockholm. Uh, at SEI, we are now preparing for the, um, uh, commemoration meeting, you could say, taking place in June next year in Stockholm, a UN international meeting commemorating uh, the Stockholm Declaration, but also pushing the sustainable development agenda. We are preparing a scientific report and I'm very happy to have Idri with us as advisors. So from that perspective, I'm really personally curious to hear ideas, critiques and inspiration from our speakers today. Uh, how can we renew multilateralism? Because 50 years, this is quite, uh, quite a long time, it's two generations, you could say. Have we succeeded or failed uh, with multilateralism for the environment? So uh, with that context, let's go to the topic and big question for this debate this afternoon. Um, and again, let me remind everyone uh, watching also of the opportunity to ask questions and comments to our very um, distinguished speakers. Uh, in this session, we will aim to create an encounter between uh, radically innovative concepts uh, with the real politic of, of what can be achieved in the current political landscape and in a very tense world in many ways. So the, the guiding question is, are the current infrastructures capable of governing a transition towards sustainability? And if so, how do they need to be reconfigured, adapted, reformed? or do they need a complete rethink and overhaul? And what are the big alternatives? So to tackle this very difficult, challenging question, uh, we have two very experienced and distinguished speakers. Uh, Sheila Jasanoff, who is Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, 
we know are as a pioneer of science and technology studies, uh, which looks at the relationships between science, technology, law and uh, political power. Uh, Professor Jasanoff has recently argued that globalization is as much a problem uh, for international harmony as it is a necessary condition of living together on this planet. But she argues that global governance must uh, become, or must accommodate differences and respect aspects of the local in a better way in institutions that transcend localism. So the question is, of course, how do we achieve this? Uh, she also calls for more humble ways of knowing and understanding humanity's planetary future. Uh, how can we include different visions, knowledges and strategies uh, when building the architecture of global governance? Finally, uh, she has stated that sustainability may call for a new imaginary of the unmodern, which sounds very exciting and we are looking forward to, to you unpacking that. Um, so this will be an outsider perspective, if I may call it that, and then we are also very happy to have more of an insider perspective, a thinker and a doer in foreign policy um, and multilateral institution building. Uh, we have Mr. Manuel lafont Wapnoui, who has a long diplomatic career working for the French government, um, including working uh, with the UN Security Council, and he also later joined the European Council for Foreign Relations as a senior policy fellow and head of the Paris office. And now he leads the Center for Analysis, Strategy and Planning at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So uh, Mr. Lafon Rapnoy has, has uh, identified the many challenges to global governance, but also notes some successes where it's working, uh, for example, in informal and ad hoc uh, cooperation. And uh, in, in sort of looking at possible reforms, he has uh, called for a global governance that protects uh, people and also seeking a cooperative brand of sovereignty. Also very interesting ideas that we look forward to getting unpacked. So uh, with that introduction, um, we will uh, start tackling this big question of whether we can adapt current multilateral institutions or where, whether we need to completely rethink and, and rehaul. But to get a, a sense of where we are coming into this debate and, and where are our expectations, I wanted to, to ask a, a quicker question to our two speakers. If you were to provide us the health check of multilateralism now, today, October 2021, uh, do you see a glass half full or a glass half empty? Or are we looking at completely the wrong glass? So basically, is multilateralism over or underperforming? And where are your expectations? So if I may start with you, uh, Professor Jasanaf or Sheila, if I may. Yes, so of course you may. And um, I too would like to begin by congratulating Idri and thanking the organizers and Karin uh, Antun in particular for offering us this opportunity to have an interesting conversation. So you were kind enough to share some of these questions, at least in sketchy form, uh, beforehand. And I was thinking that um, the third option that you've outlined, the not glass half full, half empty, but an entirely different glass, is probably what we're looking at. And I think that that glass has to include the contributions that people in social and political theory make. I mean, so I think it's important to understand that even discourses like multilateralism are themselves historically grounded. They come out of times and places and the lateral of multilateralism has tended to focus on states, that is the conventional understanding of multilateralism is still more keyed to an understanding of government than of governance, which is the word that you've been using. So back around the turn of this century, when people stopped actually talking about government and moved over more to governance. I work in an institution that's still called the Kennedy School of Government. But if you look at the inside structure of what we do in the school, it's much more about a wider palette of power being exercised through various institutions. 
the way that people depicted it was to sh was to argue that what had previously looked like a column of three entities that were all governmental, local, regional, and international, but government was now more a matrix of nine boxes because you could have another column that was about the private sector still organized in local, regional, and multinational, and a third column that was about civil society also organized in local, regional, and multinational. And governance then became something about the interplay of all of those things. So I think that the multilateralism idea that imagines the General Assembly, you know, being the heart of the action, that obviously is not the right class. And if you were looking at that, then you probably would be looking at more, more than half empty, perhaps. But if we are taking the more complicated uh, looping interactions of all of these different sectors organized at these different levels into account, then I think in a sense, people are voting with their feet. Multilateralism reigns. It's just not channeled only through government. And I think that we can delve deeper into these ideas, but I would first love to hear what Manuel, sitting in a seat of government, uh, <laughs> thinks about this question as well. Thanks. Yeah, over to you, Manuel. Do you see a half empty, half full glass or, or many glasses? It's better than it was uh, a year ago, let's say. Uh, uh, but clearly, there are deeper challenges than just who sits in the Oval Office of the White House. Um, I would agree, actually, with what uh, Sheila Janasov just said about uh, the problem is not only about half full or half empty, it's also the nature of the glass. Um, thinking in terms of breakdown of bre or breakthrough, which is often what one does, which is uh, still what the UN Secretary General report, our common agenda does, is helpful in a way, but it misses the fact that there are many trends that have transformed multilateralism and I fully agree with uh, uh, what has just been said about the, the, how the eruption of different actors has changed the game and, and the rise of non-governmental actors clearly is one of the, these trends that have transformed multilateralism and keeps on transforming it. But you have a few others. You have these very strong preference uh, by states for informal, minilateral, ad hoc versions of multilateralism. Uh, probably deeper than that, uh, that explain this kind of growing preference. You have a, the, the idea that some countries have a vision of the multilateral order as a low cost order, just as a low cost airplane company. You pay only for what you're interested in. You don't have to pay for the rest just to minimize the cost and minimize the responsibilities. And that has a consequence uh, for the rules based order. Um, you also have regionalization, which uh, clearly is something uh, quite uh, significant in terms of transforming the landscape. And, uh, and it's not just uh, regionalization, it's a deeper and broader trend of fragmentation of global governance, uh, also because of the complexity of the issues, but clearly uh, of the complexity of the architecture, of the viable geometries of the institutions and of the treaties. And more recently, as a consequence of great power competition, too. And so this fragmentation itself then leads to competition between institutions. Um, if, if you think in terms of COP20, where we were when COP21 was the next COP and where we are now, I think it's clear for a number of us that there is less optimism now than there was for uh, in October for COP21. Um, and it's, I'm not sure it, the problem is just because we're moving from decision to action. Uh, uh, people wonder if the Paris Agreement could be agreed upon today. And I'm not that pessimistic myself, but I take it as a sign that uh, solidarity and cooperation are more difficult in a context of strategic competition, of, of big power competition. And, and my last point on that is that it's a mistake to believe that there are some issues calling for competition, such as security, and others calling for cooperation, such as climate, health, uh, what has happened to us with the COVID crisis, has shown that 
competition actually also takes place in the areas which are calling for cooperation. We had mass diplomacy, we had vaccine diplomacy, we had tensions on the investigation to clarify the origins on the, of the pandemic. And so this competition is, a, is probably the, the major recent change uh, if you want to do a health check for multilateralism. Thank you very much. Uh, great to have this um, introductory diagnosis uh, of where we are from both of you. So, so let's um, turn uh, back to you, Sheila, and, and um, um, what you basically said there was that, well, multilateralism is one uh, subcategory, perhaps, within a broader matrix of global governance. Um, but how do you think that um, we can adapt uh, current global institutions or would a, a bigger um, rethink and, and overhaul uh, be needed or does it um, and does that sort of are, are you speaking specifically to multilateral cooperation uh, or, or sort of um, the wider conception of global governance Thank you. Uh, this uh, question of a complete overhaul, I mean, I think there was something in the briefing documents from Manuel expressing deep skepticism about that idea, but I'd love to hear what he has to say. I don't think that overhaul is the right metaphor in that sense myself, because it implies a central local locus of action from which the planning for this overhaul has to issue. It implies that there is some design in somebody's mind. And I think we live in a much more chaotic world than that. The whole idea that somebody is going to, you know, come up with a game plan in which the pieces, the jigsaw puzzle of the world will be fitted together in a way that is more rational and works better. I mean, I think we've already been there, done that, and it doesn't work. And in a sense, I would look at the kinds of phenomena that Manuel was talking about before, the regionalization and the fragmentation, as part of the answer in a sense that it acknowledges that there are issues, that there are directions that do not lend themselves to a global centrally managed idea. And from that point of view, although of course I deeply and profoundly agree that the situation in the US and the occupancy of the Oval Office has made a huge difference, perhaps it's also worth acknowledging that the demotion in power of the two poles of the bipolar world opens up a set of possibilities that did not exist before. I mean, so for instance, if we're talking about regions, the emergence of the Asian region as a global power, but with it, its own problems of hegemony that are local and, you know, that depend to a large extent on what is going on in other parts of the world. I mean, obviously in the US, we have been reading recently of a trilateral political, what should we call it, misunderstanding that involved some a country in the global south, but not of the global south, Australia and France in the US. I mean, you know, this is a kind of regionalization or a triad that is not, you know, it's geometrically even, you know, a, a, a demonstration of the strange lines and alliances and allegiances that are cutting across the world. So I think that the, rather than talking about complete overhaul, I would prefer to see a discussion focusing on the places where things are going right and the places where things are going wrong. So there are certainly places where we have much more centralization, climate, if you want to take that, climate science, which has been to some extent directing these COP meetings that Manuel has already referred to, that is an exceedingly pinnacle type of activity, you know, driven by scientific and technological capabilities that are still very concentrated. And there's a question about how that relates to parts of the world that do not have the capability to participate in a knowledgeable way in those kinds of debates. So in a sense, I mean, partly because of what Idri is and partly because of where you yourself are located, I hope that we will come back to talking about environmental issues. But again, 
uh, not to monopolize, let me again hand the conversation back to you. So do we have a response from you, uh, Manuel, on, in terms of this bigger question, adaptation or overhaul? Yeah, I, I'd say adaptation is insufficient and overall is unlikely. And, and based on the conditions for uh, precedence overhauls, uh, which means basically major catastrophes, global wars, it's probably not desirable that we reach this point. Uh, what I think is the complete rethink uh, uh, that you mentioned uh, clearly is important, even if uh, a rehaul is not going to happen uh, either centrally, as Sheila said, or uh, institution instantaneously, instantaneously, uh, at just like by a snap of, uh, of fingers. Uh, the, the rethink is important because not to have a game plan, I would agree with that, but to have a sense of direction. My job is a, to be a policy planner. The, one of the motto we have in policy planning is plans are useless, but planning is essential. Plans are useless because nothing ever happens according to plan, but planning is essential because then you know where you want to go, what you need, what it will take, who you want to work with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm not uh, uh, sure that uh, uh, reform is just about uh, institutions. Uh, most of the time when people think in terms of reform of global governance, they think in terms of reform of memberships, powers and attributions of institutions. And clearly, I do believe institutions do matter, uh, but the content of uh, global public policies matter just as well. Um, in, in the previous session, we had uh, Rémi Rioux from the Agence Française de Développement, which, uh, who talked about finance in common, which is an effort to align development assistance flows with and, and goals from the Paris Agreement. Uh, funding is a major and often overlooked uh, dimension. So there is this effort to align financial flows, but look at budgetary constraints, but also look at the growing importance and imbalance between voluntary and earmarked often uh, contributions and assess contributions. That really changes the way institutions can operate. If you think in terms of the increasing uh, uh, importance of private funding, all these trends on funding have a strong impact, uh, including in terms of time consistency of uh, uh, global uh, institutions' actions and in terms of their, the independence of their uh, efforts. Um, and if you even broaden the scope to the systemic level, often some of the problem, major problems we are facing are not to improve this or that institution or this or that policy uh, uh, that these institutions are responsible for, it's also, or, or more often even, uh, even more to take into account the multidimensionality and the complexity of the problem and to break down silos. Trade and climate is one of the major issues now, and you're not going to solve it by reforming WTO on one side and uh, um, the, the architecture of uh, climate uh, policy on, on the other side. The question is, how do you connect the two? How do you link it? And if you look at the debate about the carbon border adjustment mechanism idea, which clearly is not a magic one, it's just one example of a broader issue of how to articulate non-discrimination principle with the need not to punish decarbonation efforts and those who undertake it. Um, this debate is very interesting in how breaking stovepipes is sometimes more important than uh, um, reforming uh, institutions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, clearly it's about resourcing uh, institutions uh, as well uh, as, as enabling them to do their job. Um, if we could, uh, both of you have mentioned climate change and the climate regime. Uh, if we could focus on that for a little while. Um, if you work in the climate regime or focus on this in your research, I mean, it's easy to see all the uh, lack of progress or imperfections, etc. But I'm curious to know also if you look at climate change within the larger field of multilateral cooperation, what do you think it works generally well or not well? Um, but also addressing this question that you raised, uh, Sheila, about knowledge production and, and the consequences of that for actually uh, um, the, the level of you like in the climate regime. Well, so, um, the climate regime raises a lot of really fascinating questions, but I would like to go back to 
the question about institutions, financing, development, and so forth, and are something very basic that has puzzled me since day one of when I became interested in global environmental issues. I mean, as far as the climate is concerned, it is a place where we have uh, designated responsibilities at the national level. And there has been this mathematical calculus that says that countries with low individual emissions but high populations should be as responsible as countries with relatively lower populations but high individual emissions. Now, why is that? I mean, what is the ontology of the world that says that responsibility should be parceled out in terms of the boundaries of nation states and not in terms of the boundaries of human needs and wants? I mean, you mentioned my term unmodern before, but we know that modernity as a social and political phenomenon as something that came upon us People can disagree about the history or what it entails, but that it has been associated with a particular form of living on Earth, which has proved to be unsustainable and potentially near catastrophic. And yet, in some sense, our imagination of what the world should achieve remains linear in the same way that we have to first of all, lift people out of poverty through development. But then because that development will necessarily create emissions, we then have to think about end of pipeline solutions for how to deal with those emissions. But if you take account of the fact that the ethical debates around the climate regime were not attended to from the very beginning, the ethical debates that said there should be two kinds of responsibility. One is from the more emitting richer individuals of the world or populations of the world towards the less emitting individuals or populations. And another kind of responsibility for the historical production of the conditions of possibility for the climate catastrophe in the first place. And then let's think about governance, not in scientific and technological terms, keyed to what should the mean temperature rise be? How can we control it? What should the technologies be? And how does that relate to distributing know-how throughout the world? But instead, key it to the moral dimensions of how we got to this place in the first instance, then you would have a very different look at the world. But unfortunately, that is where power and democracy come into play because the people who were making that argument, who have been making those arguments, are not the people in a position to control the financial institutions. They're not in a position to have even a place where they declare themselves. I mean, I think about symbolic politics and it is interesting that in the lead up to the Paris COP, which was indeed a breakthrough, I mean, I applaud that, but it, was, it came after a terrorist tragedy in Paris, and therefore a lot of the public demonstrations, which were a traditional way in which civil society expressed itself at these COP meetings, had to be cancelled. And there was this very poignant moment where spontaneously people came and brought shoes and put them at the Place de la Concorde, I think. Anyway, there, was, there were these hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes representing the silent people who were not there. And I talked about that moment with my classes that I was teaching at the time. And I said, well, who is excluded from this demonstration? And these are Harvard students, they're very bright. And they talked about the disabled and how the wheelchairs were not represented. And I come from South Asia, I come from India. And I thought to myself, nobody in this Harvard class is thinking about the people who don't wear shoes. So that was to me one of these wake up moments at which the combination of tragedy, forecasting, who speaks, who governs, came together in that pictorial moment of the bare shoes in Paris. But it spoke to the question of whose climate whose governance, whose policy, whose power.
Thank you. Um, so, uh, Manuela, do you, do you have any comments or thoughts on this question on the representation that, that Sheila raises? Uh, you, you talked earlier about the, the problems of coordination and making the machinery work, but, but from your perspective, also, do, you, do you feel that um, uh, multilateral institutions today adequately represent uh, the people that they are serving? So, um, again, I'm, I'm a policy planner. Uh, so, as policy planner, I, I speak uh, uh, independently. My views do not necessarily represent government uh, views. Uh, but what I can tell you is this is exactly something that we are working on here at French Policy Planning. Um, this, this democratic question and the idea that to uh, associate uh, the people to multilateral uh, diplomacy and to foreign policy in general much more than uh, we've done in the past. And there are things that are happening uh, in that direction. Um, the, the, I mentioned the UNSG uh, report, Our Common Agenda. It's based on a consultation of over one million people. So one million people is very little with compared to the global population, but clearly it's, uh, uh, and, and clearly there are people who have been uh, not able to participate uh, to, to these, but clearly there is something uh, that is being done there. And the report itself calls for more effort in that direction, specifically towards the youth, which I think is important. You've got right now a number of uh, uh, efforts in the European Union context. Currently you have the Conference on the Future of Europe, that is taking place after the 2018 Europe citizens consultations. And by the way, uh, the consultations of 2018 stressed the importance for the citizens amendment. And it stressed also uh, Europe's responsibilities vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the rest of the world on these issues. So when you give voice uh, to the people, they do use it on the issues that we are discussing today. Um, but there are, there are a few others, uh, other examples. I, I also have in mind, for instance, the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People that was launched at the January uh, uh, One Planet Summit. Uh, and that High Ambition Coalition also aims at making room for indigenous people and local communities in so, uh, 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 as a consequence of the fact that they often are uh, uh, those who live in and are protectors of the most biodiverse uh, sites. Um, and, and I clearly believe that it is indispensable for both legitimacy and effectiveness purposes and inevitable anyway, as far as I am concerned, to go in that direction. The, the trick for uh, diplomats, uh, for governments, is that multilateral action remains uh, um, a, a, a level of action where you act with states. One of the things that was interesting with the US pulling out from the Paris Agreement was that the US nonetheless stayed on a positive trajectory, probably insufficient as many other countries, but still uh, uh, rather positively oriented because of the action of local governments and businesses, etc., who had who kept the anticipation that there was a need to move in that direction and that at some point the US should and would go back to the Paris Agreement, which did happen, so that's uh, good. But you still work with states and you can't wait for the democratization of all member states. And even when some of these states are democratic, they may take a different direction, as I've just mentioned. And so how do you make progress on, on this idea of involving people and civil society. Uh, and, and that's not just multi-stakeholderism. It's, it's a more democratic uh, uh, level uh, uh, that I think we are talking, of, uh, talking about right now. But nonetheless, uh, move on the multi more government to government multilateral level because time is of the essence. Thanks a lot, uh, Manuel. And, and actually, we have one other example. Maybe we could add to the, these um, steps taken to, to uh, broaden representation. Let's say is this um, Global Citizens Assembly that the UK government, as host of the upcoming uh, climate negotiations, are running 
uh, ahead of Glasgow. It will be uh, an interesting experiment to watch. But, but what do you say, Sheila, about these uh, efforts that, that Manuel mentioned, also our common agenda uh, and other initiatives where states and international organizations seek to consult with people? Um, is, is it enough or is it just um, symbolic? Um, can it have an effect? The problems that we confront today globally are so huge that I would not rule out any efforts that people are making in the multilateral direction and in the direction of curbing the excesses of our civilization. I wouldn't rule out any of them as irrelevant or, uh, I mean, because they're not enough is not an, a reason to rule it out. I mean, it has to be part of the mix. But the deeper questions of, well, what are the things that are being ignored? And there, I think that it's not just a question of climate. I mean, if I in my life consider whether in 2021, the world is a better place for women's rights, I would have to say it's questionable. It's questionable whether 1990 was not a more hopeful place a generation back. Now, obviously, there are many more women in positions of power and, you know, have more wealth and the disparity in America between in wages has gone from, you know, now it's 82 cents to the dollar instead of 69 or whatever it was a number of decades back. But that's not the only thing that's going on. So we talked about a minute ago about resources that are important for climate and how they're being governed. And one can take any case study one wants. The Amazon comes to mind as one that's frequently adduced. And one can think about what the nature of government in that country is. So one can look at Europe. I am a Europe aficionado, as anybody who knows my work knows. And I've frequently written comparatively. Uh, even now, I'm engaged in a large research project looking at the responses to COVID in 16 countries. These are policy responses, Manuel, and Europe is very heavily represented among those 16 countries. And overall, the finding, a finding of that project is that countries that have a strong tradition of solidarity have done on the whole better at dealing with COVID and solidarity is the name of social democracy in Europe. And you know it is an invention of that region. Nevertheless, Europe is not doing too well at controlling things like anti-democratic movements in the peripheral na nations of Europe. The response to the 2008 crisis was anything but edifying. And of course, we're having a turnover in government in what is de facto one of the most powerful states inside the European Union. So everybody is watching that transition with a little bit of trepidation about what's going to come next. So, you know, as a confirmed internationalist, globalist, my life is inscribed with the United Nations, which is what brought me to the United States in the first place. I look around the world and I don't see that the hope for creativity is necessarily coming from these power centers that are organizing the meetings. Uh, I'll just conclude by saying that several years ago at the Science and Democracy Network, which is a group of STS scholars that I have helped draw together, a conclusion of this meeting was that public participation ceases to be genuine and meaningful as soon as it gets organized, that it's the uninvited participation, the unruly mob in a sense that produces the ideas. And these consultation exercises already tame the flow of ideas to such an extent that it becomes a re-ratification of status quo. And, you know, so do I think it should not happen as a result? No, I am actually a in favor of all kinds of experimentation for the reasons that I said. A response from you, Manuel, to these thoughts. So I, I agree with a lot of what I said, and I want to uh, comment on, on one specific thing. Uh, uh, Shayla mentioned the importance as a key factor of the 
better or not so good response to the COVID crisis. But uh, there is another factor, and often it is very uh, narrowly linked, which is trust. And I think it's interesting because uh, uh, when you look at COVID, you look at trust at uh, an internal uh, uh, level, internal scale uh, within a society. But I suspect that trust is also international trust is also a big issue. And, and I'm sure it's the case on COVID. And I'm pretty convinced also that it's the case on climate and many other global governance issues. If you look at one, one of the other trends that I did not mention earlier of the evolution of multilateralism and how multilateralism is done and practiced and, and designed, there is a strong pushback right now on all those instruments and mechanisms that were invented to, to provide trust, to build trust. Um, verification, inspection, uh, monitoring, transparency, uh, common metrics, fact-finding mission, et cetera, et cetera. Those were all instruments that were meant to provide trust. If, if the key issue of the international system is that states don't trust each other or can't trust all of the others, because uh, as uh, Sheila mentioned, uh, one of the merits of the EU, for instance, is that there is a degree of trust between EU member states, which is probably higher than uh, elsewhere. But one of the issues with globalization is that just trusting your neighbors is not enough anymore. You need to be able to trust uh, many other uh, uh, actors. And so if you can't trust all of them, at least you need to have some kind of mechanisms and some kind of actors not just as last resort actors, but clearly even more as last resort actors and, and trust them. And those mechanisms, those uh, uh, trust building uh, uh, institutions are the natural institutions. The IMF is the last resort lender in financial terms. Uh, the Security Council is the collective security uh, uh, organism. And there is this idea that uh, those verification, inspection, monitoring, transparency, etc., mechanisms are there precisely to provide some kind of trust that you can have in the fact that commitments are going to be fulfilled. And, and right now, I think it's one of the issue that climate uh, multilateralism, but also uh, uh, other, I mentioned health, I could mention arms control. It's it's very diverse uh, number of, uh, of issues where trust is a really big uh, uh, challenge for multilateral cooperation. Thank you. Um, very interesting um, perspective there on, on trust and, and accountability and the sort of technocracy that international organizations provide. I, I will soon take some questions from the audience, but I wanted just to, to hear from you, uh, Sheila, because I heard you, Manuel, speak very you know clearly that still states are, I mean, kind of essential actors, of course, in multilateralism, but uh, but Sheila, you um, uh, were talking more about also the role of movements kind of speaking directly to, to the global level in a sense, or if perhaps I misunderstood, I mean, both of you were uh, expressing sympathy with these uh, various consultation exercises. But, but can you elaborate a bit on how you see the, the role of the uh, uh, the national government in global governance going forward, uh, Sheila? Well, so national governments remain important because they control certain kinds of instruments that are not available to other people. I mean, border controls, for instance. I mean, even if the platform technologies transcend borders, nevertheless, they do not yet control the passport stations and it still remains important. It's it's the US government that decides that the land borders between Canada and Mexico are going to be lifted today and belatedly that Europeans may come into the US again after an 18 month hiatus or nearly 20 month hiatus. That is not something that I could decide. That's not something that any civil society organization could decide. So nation states obviously remain relevant. But I don't think that in the discussion we've stressed enough how irrelevant they are at times. And absolutely, we haven't stressed enough the degree of criticism against these very hegemonic institutions like the IMF. I mean, I would not like to leave this discussion without acknowledging that movements like Occupy in the US and other organizations that have been 
brewing since the demonstrations against the World Trade Organization, that there is a counter discourse to globalization that says globalization for whom and in whose interests. And, you know, this is the entire discussion about neoliberalism that rears its ugly head in this context. So how are we to live? Whose finances and who's making the profits? Why is it that the economic experts of globalization failed to foresee? I mean, let's take my country, the United States, as an example, just to stay parochial and not intrude on anybody else's political space. Obviously, the, the economic experts who said that globalization was a good thing did not take the regional impacts fully into account and absolutely did not take the political implications of those regional impacts into account at all. And one can trace a fairly linear, I'm not a linear thinker, but one can still trace a fairly linear connection between today's so-called toxic polarization in the US and the emptying out of the industrial centers and forms of life. I mean, you know, I travel very frequently to Germany and France and, you know, employment is treated differently there. Solidarity rests on economic foundations, which have to do with how people are earning, your, earning their money. You are so from Sweden, obviously know this extremely well. In Sweden for COVID, there were fewer mandates than in most other European countries. And why were there fewer mandates? Because of pulling back on one of the words that Manuel used, trust. I mean, that is a sense that given the technical knowledge, citizens were mature enough to do you know, what they were supposed to do. And so governmental action was not needed. Masking mandates, the things that we're fighting about in the streets in America, were not problematic in Sweden, right? I mean, so one has to go back to the sort of social and political and economic foundations of these societies we've created and recognize that under the name of globalization, tremendous wrongs were done to large numbers of people and that some of these institutions are responsible for those wrongs. And we have to rectify those and take the critique on board before we can have this you know, celebration of consultation or inclusion or whatever. Thank you, uh, Sheila, for that. Do you have a, um, do you want to respond, Manuel, to this? Well, it's not a, a response. It's a, it's a kind of a, a follow up. Uh, to, since we are in this kind of a, a, a role play uh, of uh, the, the thinker, try to, to do something in practice with their uh, small arms. Um, I think on that issue that there is uh, uh, Clearly, something about uh, where where is the global co consensus? There, there used to be a time when everybody was talking about the Washington consensus, whether that was a global consensus or whether that was a consensus in Washington between the U.S. Treasury, the IMF, and the World Bank is a question that uh, is still being <laughs> discussed. But clearly, uh, uh, whether it was one or the other, uh, there is an issue now with the fact that this consensus has has failed and that its limitations are much more uh, obvious. The, the problem is that the the um, there is no obvious hair to the consensus and so by some kind of default uh, it still is an inspiration for a lot of the international public policies uh, that we've been mentioning um, and and we clearly need to draw lesson from these failures and these limitations but also from the challenges that we anticipate and climate would be one but there are uh, uh, quite others uh, let's talk about digital let's talk about I'm not going to go for a long list uh, we we need to forge such a kind of renewed and probably much more inclusive political consensus um, because because I agree with what Sheila said earlier about the idea that things are going to be centrally managed and that there is a, a, a big uh, a unique uh, a game plan that, that doesn't work. But political consensus can provide for the convergence of our practices and our behaviors. It can provide for the convergence of the actions of the various institutions uh, and the various level of actions that we mentioned. Uh, that, that is more or less the role played by the uh, MDGs and then the SDGs. It was not an institutional reform. It was not a binding treaty. It was not a public policy as such but it had a strong coordination impact. 
and it had an impact because it was reflective of a, a, a kind of emerging consensus. And clearly, the COVID, uh, 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 if we look at what it has done to us and, and what it has revealed, etc., it is calling for a renewed consensus on the kind of globalization that we need, because I, I'm not sure the issue is globalization as such, but clearly there is an issue with the, the model of globalization that we have followed so far. So what, what other models can we, can we get? And that has to do with what Shella was mentioning in terms of uh, being more creative and uh, giving more space to, to political imagination. But this is, this is a discussion that uh, we, we are only starting. There was an attempt to launch that discussion at the last edition of the Paris Peace Forum, which takes place every November. So the next one in one month is probably going to be an opportunity to, to discuss where we are in this effort of building a, a new consensus. But this, this should happen uh, not just in Paris at the, at the Peace Forum. This should happen in, in many other places. And those places should meet and discuss to, to forge that consensus. Thank you, and, and for informing us about this upcoming opportunity as well. Um, I wanted to take a couple of questions from the audience before we then start wrapping up. Um, time is flying, I have to say. Um, one question for Sheila uh, from Dennis Kuve. What are your thoughts about the notion of ecological civilization to replace the notion of sustainable development? So uh, that's a really interesting question, and I'm not fully prepared to comment on it. That is an idea that comes out of the Chinese context and has been put forward as an alternative. But uh, there are questions about when a word remains at the rhetorical level and how it relates to practice. Uh, of course, I think in philosophical terms that all of the world has moved towards recognizing that the intimacy of the connection between the nature of our civilizations and the nature of our uses of the environment. So it's not only that one term, but, but even the geological term Anthropocene is a kind of recognition and acknowledgement that how we live on the planet affects the planet that we live on and that this is a recursive loop on many different levels. I think that the, the, way that I approach the connection between thinking and doing, to go back to Emmanuel's formulation, is that to some extent thinking happens through doing. I mean, so as a theorist, I believe that people are enacting theories all the time and that doers are thinkers as well as thinkers are doers. Uh, I certainly do a lot that's political within my institutional context of the, of the university. So you know, I think that the a question to ask is where, I mean, if there is a global recognition, as I think there is, this is a positive development, it's a glass more than half full, that we as humanity have an imprint on the planet, and we as humanity have a responsibility for that imprint on the planet. Instead of staying at the level of the label, let's ask whether the label is helping to crystallize forces that are prepared to act on that in innovative ways. And, you know, so then you, then the devil becomes in the details and you have to start looking at, you know, here's the youth movement saying future generations are our responsibility, but how are the legal systems, the Supreme courts of the world relating to that? Here is China with its own terminology for how to be good environmental citizens bulldozing ahead on coal-fired power plants. You know, how do we put the two things in conversation with one another? So that would be a sort of very brief sketch of a response. Thank you very much. And the one uh, question from the audience, if I can direct it to you, Manuel, is about civil society and that uh, traditional nation states continue to be central in international cooperation. Um, civil society representatives are actually noticing that they have a shrinking and not an expanding political space in global governance. If this is a trend, how could we go towards more multi-stakeholder governance in a more genuine uh, form? I'm not so, so sure that 
trend is as unequivocal uh, as it was mentioned. I think that clearly there are a number of contexts where uh, the constraints and the, the repression even on civil society are stronger than they were before. But uh, in terms of global governance, uh, I think that on the contrary, we have moved from a, uh, an, org an organization of multilateral action where civil society had mostly a consultative uh, role. It was on the side, you had side events, you had counter summits, uh, you had consultations, et cetera, and, and then it was back to government to government uh, uh, business where the big decisions were made. And this is less and less the case. And as, uh, 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 as a diplomat, I can testify that diplomats take into account the need to not just uh, have a moment where you hear uh, uh, civil society and let them uh, tell you what they really feel is important, and then you go back to work, but to find ways to uh, have a much more integrated uh, way to do things. So I'm not saying we are there yet and there is no progress to be made, but clearly uh, there is this idea of multi-stakeholderism, which is taking more and more uh, uh, space to, um, on, on, on promoting uh, uh, multilateralism. Germany and France have set up this uh, uh, idea of an alliance for multilateralism which is to mobilize governments that believe in the need for rules-based multilateral cooperation. Uh, and this mobilization happens uh, uh, through at coalitions uh, that take an initiative, and, and these coalitions converge with more institutional and inclusive formats, especially UN arenas. And most of these coalitions uh, actually are multi-actors coalitions. Um, and, and some of them are even uh, civil society-led. There is a big, big effort which is called the, the uh, Information and Democracy uh, Forum, and now the Information and Democracy Partnership, which is a civil society-led uh, uh, effort, not just to fight against manipulation of information, but to fight for uh, quality standards for information and uh, fact-checking, etc. And it's a good thing that it is not government-led, that precisely this is about civil society uh, uh, doing its part uh, of the job. There is another big effort that was taken in this context of the Alliance for Multilateralism and was launched actually at a previous edition of the Paris Peace Forum, which is the Paris Call for Trust and Security in the Cyberspace. And here you have another of government who say we need rules, rules of the road for security and trust in the cyberspace and we're going to do our part. But they are also a, a part of what has to be done, which actually depends on uh, businesses. Um, security by design in applications and uh, instruments is not a government's role. It's businesses' roles. It's businesses' responsibilities. Keeping uh, uh, update available uh, for uh, security patches, etc., even for an old software, which is one of the source of the major uh, uh, cyber security vulnerabilities, is uh, a responsibility for uh, uh, businesses. So the idea that you need to get uh, uh, these various actors together and to help with the convergence of their resources and their efforts in funding, in expertise, in legitimacy, and in their respective responsibilities is really uh, uh, key. And I, I suspect we're going to see more and more of that. The problem is how do you reconcile the two things that I've mentioned? The, the fact that in many countries there is less space for civil society and more repression, uh, and, and the fact that at the global level there is clearly a need for a more multi-stakeholderism in a way. Thank you so much. Uh, again, time is unfortunately flying, and I wanted to wrap up with a very um, uh, last question to both of you. Very short answers, if you can. Um, it was mentioned uh, earlier that the UN Secretary General has um, launched this our common agenda, uh, sort of a, quite an ambitious and bold plan for reform. Uh, from my perspective, mentions uh, many things that you have mentioned here. Uh, for example, the need for renewed social contracts uh, with people, building trust. Uh, really, especially building trust with the younger generations, taking a more uh, future generations perspective, etc. So, uh, I was wondering, uh, are you hopeful that this new agenda can um, uh, get support? And what would your key advice be to the UN Secretary General taking this forward? <laughs> 
starting with you, Sheila. I was hoping you would start with Manuel because it's a policy proposal coming from an institution. <laughs> and uh, anyway, how can one not agree with something called our common agenda, where if one is a humanist, as I am, um, but what hoop do I put in it? I mean, the fact is that I live in a country where the majority of people have no idea what the United Nations is, let alone what it does. Uh, so I think that there's an uphill battle for the United Nations to restore itself. I mean, you know, we are, what, about 100 years into the history of League of Nations, United Nations, and all of its ramifications. So one could, one could ask, you know, what should a United Nations look like today? Um, and I, I'm not sure that our common agenda... Uh, that already imagines the United Nations in place and then it's looking out and designing the common agenda. I don't think that that's necessarily as fruitful as imagining what if humanity were to unite in common, it would wish to do to rethink the United Nations. So in a way, what would that reversal of the arrow look like? And to what extent is the Secretary General willing to take the reimagination of the United Nations on board as part of this problem. That is a question I would put to, to the UN leadership in general. Thank you. Very, very interesting answer there. And over to you, Manuel. Um, so there are a lot of things that I believe are uh, useful and uh, good in the, in the report. Some of them have been on the table for a number of years, so clearly uh, if I was to advise the Secretary General, I would probably work on a paper on why didn't it work so far, because it's not just by having a good proposal that you end up with a solution. I'm thinking in terms of metrics uh, of uh, the, to, to leave uh, GDP uh, less of a central role on the idea of governance of global public goods, which is also something that uh, has been discussed uh, several times. Um, I, one of the things that I like very much the approach uh, uh, to approach issues in terms of risk. And I would have loved to hear from Shaila about that, uh, actually. Um, not everything is a threat, uh, which is sometimes what you feel when you hear uh, foreign policy discourses. Uh, risks are an uh, integral part of our activities, of technology. And, and you have these ideas of uh, uh, how, how could we organize with a a global chief risk officer uh, and a global uh, uh, risk policy. And it's not just more resilience. It's not just risk management as com most companies do it. It's probably something deeper than that. And this is something that we're digging into uh, uh, right now. But the one thing that I really believe is uh, very, very interesting, and, and I have a lot of hopes that it's going to be uh, not just supported by member states, but actually fruitful in terms of changing the dynamics, is this idea of taking on board future generations' uh, interest and, and be much more forward-looking with this idea of a summit of the future and institutionalizing strategic foresight, not because for the sake of having an institution or, or an office, but for the, the sake of embedding it uh, in the way uh, the UN uh, works. And I think that has potential for both opening the space for imagination that I think both of us uh, are calling for, uh, and also for uh, uh, leaving some space out of this uh, strategic competition mindset that is taking a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, attention and a lot of room in the international uh, uh, system right now. And I don't want to end without uh, wishing happy birthday to Idri. And I was really delighted to be invited to the party. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. And uh, with that, we are uh, actually have run a bit over time. Um, I apologize for that. But uh, a very warm thank you to Professor Sheila Jasanov and Manuel Lafon Rapnoy for their um, generous sharing of perspective and thoughts. I'm not going to try to summarize this, this conversation, but we covered uh, issues like um, sort of governance while still somehow we're uh, in ways operating in a more government mindset. 
we talked about funding, representation, trust building, uh, the need to also recognize failures before celebrating successes and launching sort of ambitious um, plans for the future. But I think one word I heard from both of you uh, was the need to rethink. Um, again, you had different perspectives on this, uh, working as a policy planner or as a, a critical social scientist, looking at these institutions from the outside. But again, a very warm thank you. And there were some questions we did not have time for from the audience. So I hope you can um, uh, enjoy the, the excellent readings from Sheila and Manuel and continue the conversation there. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the week.